I'm glad to be here talking to Benjamin Mulpier, who I guess is called Benjamin when he gets in France. Um, you uh, were actually born in Dakar, I think, in Senegal. Is that true? Or well, did you, were you just raised there? I was raised there, yeah. I, um, I moved there a few months after I was born. So your first training was actually, or your first look at dance was African. Mm -hmm. That's right. Music and dance. Music yeah. and dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah my mother actually um, had a studio across the street from where we lived. And um, we lived next to a very famous family of drummers, uh, the Dudunya Rose family. I think the, something like 10 wives and 40 children. <laughs> Uh, and the, his oldest son used to play for my mother's classes, <coughs> modern dance classes, she thought at the time there. But, um, but yeah, no, I grew up to the sound of, uh, you know, West African music and definitely started, you know, my first steps were, were in African dance and modern dance. I think those lurk a little somewhere in your DNA or your artistic DNA. For sure. I mean, I, I th you know, um, first of all, I took percussions quite quickly. Um, it also means that I wasn't put into a ballet class or, you know, it was sort of part of, it was culturally, you know, people just danced and so there was a sort of a natural approach to, to dance or spontaneous that, mm -hmm. that something that I enjoyed doing just like my own son, I think, today <laughs> likes to, <laughs> to, to, to move around. So um, it was very much something that was natural and not forced into and, and so forth. And there's definitely a sense that um, choreographing is a lot like making variations on rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that my own response to mm -hmm. the music is probably very much influenced to this childhood. Mm -hmm. um, it was also clear that when I first started to choreograph, I was drawn to minimalist composers like Steve Reich and Philip Glass and so forth, who are themselves very much influenced by West African music. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first saw Balanchine, I mean, to some extent, Balanchine ballets, they were, to me, the most complex and interesting um, choreography to rhythm. Um, and Balanchine used to, to say quite often that first, on a good score, he needed good rhythms. <laughs> um, so I think there's very, very much um, a link to, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and an influence uh, in me that, that, that has to do with, with mm -hmm. my childhood in Africa. Mm -hmm. And then when you were in the, you were, while you were still in the School of American Ballet, Jerome Robbins chose you to dance in his uh, uh, piano. Uh, Two Anthropod Inventions. Yeah. You know, I wrote the book, now I just put it all out of my head. <laughs> Two and three part inventions. Um, and you were a teenager, uh, and Robbins was very interested in you. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if you, from Balanchine, of course, had been dead for almost 11 years or mm -hmm. 10 years. Robbins was very active <coughs> in the repertory, and, and uh, I'm, I'm wondering what you took away from those two men as a young dancer or a potential choreographer in terms of what you learned by looking at those ballets or listening to what you were told about performing? Well, I think, you know, mainly there's, um, as a dancer in Balanchine Ballets, um, there's, there's something that spoke to me when I was 14, when I f first saw his works, which everything, everything made so much sense. It just... It felt, and it felt that way when you danced these ballets, you know, there was just a kind of, you were listening to, listening to this music, and his response to the music is not only right in terms of its tone and atmosphere and, you know, what, what the music actually um, is saying, I think, emotionally, but also in terms of the movements that he created to it. There's never, none of his ballets ever felt awkward or, you know, there, just some, there was always a sense of, of that he was getting the truth out of the scores that he, that he choreographed to. Um, so that, that, that really, you know, that, that was kind of a, a feeling as I choreograph, I think, in how I respond to music. I mean, both, in, both good and bad, because to some extent, I think there's a few years that took, I mean, up until, I think, recently, um, leaving behind sort of all the memory that um, 
my body had from just dancing those ballets too. Mm -hmm. So in how I would respond to music in a studio as a choreographer. Um, the, other, the other really important influence I think is um, the approach to partnering, you know, which is uh -huh. Balanchine's approach to partnering is the most sophisticated, he's the most sophisticated choreographer and approach to ballet, but partnering uh, still to me is really shocking how many ballet companies haven't taken on this kind of very um, refined approach to partnering, which, which now if, you know, when I, when I look back at, um, I think when I start to now teach more and explain more, you see sort of a, the whole influence, I think, of ballroom dancing and, you know, Fred Astaire and all of, you know, the way that even, you know, the lightness on the feet and the tr transition from one foot to the other and to present the woman and to, mm -hmm. you know, use very, um, <clears throat> to never sort of use your hands in sort of, you know, big ways and use your, you know, two fingers and so forth. It's very delicate approach uh, and the off balance and so forth. And that really has had an influence as how, how I relate to uh, partnering in my, in my ballets, for sure. And I, and I think Jerry, um, I think one thing that felt very um, clear to me when I, when I, I mean, uh, uh, or the similarity is my, my approach to you know, ballet, ballet came later, so I really had this, again, mo more modern dance and uh, approach to, to dance before I studied ballet. So when I started to choreograph, when I was choreographing, even when I was 13 or 14, um, the whole sort of simplicity and uh, the and sort of the lack of uh, sort of presentation maybe to the audience uh, and more um, intimate, uh, that was something that I've, that's how I, I imagined dance mm -hmm. as a like very, very young choreographer. So when I, when I saw Jerry's work and saw that sort of simplicity and the relationships and the, the, the beautiful sort of way to enjoy dancing on stage with people around you, uh, being yourself. You know, I think he loved dancers who were very, very, had very, very clear personalities and were confident in themselves mm -hmm. and were confident on stage mm -hmm. and just responded to the moment. And all of that is something that I, that I love, dan you know, I love the work, I love dancing the work, but I also, you know, enjoy people and I'm interested, in, I'm interested in people and I'm interested in people in, 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 in the work that I develop and how they relate to one another. And <clears throat> I think the piece here that actually that I'm presenting this week was, a, was a, a year after I started the company. And it's very much about the group dynamics, which I actually just last week kind of revealed to the dancers. You know, as we were rehearsing the piece again, um, had to do with just really how they related to one another uh, in the small group, which, you know, where there were only six, you know, we, when we started. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and their relationships and the kind of funny dynamics and, and, and mm -hmm. that were taking place. Well, I think that was, even, the, even though Robbins had done so much in show business, you know, and he knew about what, he, when, what you had to do as a soccer number home on, on the Broadway stage, but his idea that you, as a, as a dancer, you're not dancing for the audience. I mean, you're dancing for the audience because that's a given, but you're dancing for each other, for one another, for the other people on the stage. And I think that uh, from his very first ballets, like um, Interplay, from the 40s, he had people sort of standing around watching other people dance or sitting down and watching them. And, that, mm -hmm. that quality that you speak of. Uh. Yeah, and I, and, and I do think it's, you know, modern dance and the fact that that's really what he started with also, you know, had a sort of a less stiff and kind of, you know, looking at yourself in the mirror and positions and so forth, mm -hmm. a more natural approach to, to dance mm -hmm. in the way that he probably related to his own body and, and mm -hmm. others, you mm -hmm. know. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so you started to choreograph that young and when you did that, was music always your source? It was very young. I mean, I think I started to, um, I, would, I would make dances when I was five years, I mean, five years old, like, you know, a kid makes drawings. You know, I, th I think the first time I went on stage when I was five or six, I w it was something that I made, yeah. Very much, very much music, yeah, because music was part of the household in such mm -hmm. a big way. Um, 
that you know, they, there's not one without the other. I mm -hmm. think uh, again, which is why I think I was so drawn to taking, you know, telling my family I wanted to move to New York when I was, you know, 15 years old, uh, because of the, you know, the, the the quality of the choreography and the quality of the music, in in you know, in Balanchine ballets. I mean, the greatest musical repertory that mm -hmm. exists. So. When you decided, I think, was it 2011 or 2012, to, to retire from the New York City Ballet, uh, presumably so you could choreograph more? Uh, yeah, I, I think you know, that, was a, that was a moment where um, I really, I mean, I think I was very much um, very curious and <coughs> wanting the need to learn from 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 you know, my environment, the people that I work with, and you know my experiences as um, as an artist, as a person in general, even in my relationships my, with my friends. Um, and I, I really felt that I come to the point where I wasn't learning anymore. I had danced all the ballets that I wanted to dance, um, <laughs> and it was also this funny point where you realize that you're starting to turn, I was 32 years old, that if you want to, so you, you know, um, actually still be good and be on a certain level, you actually have to spend more time in the studio because your body is starting to fall apart. Um, so that wasn't really, I, I, so much of it, dancing those ballets was also a physical um, enjoyment that I had of just like flying around and, you know, just um, that I didn't want to dance the same ballets with different sensations. And I just wasn't learning from the environment, I felt. Um, I'm sure there's a lot to learn you can stay, but for me it was time to, it was time to move on and, and take on new challenges. And I was lucky to have, you know, the success of, of, of the movie that was involved on Black Swan, to, that it was the right moment to also, you know, take on some, some new, uh, new challenges, which and I'm glad I did. And, and you'd all also always been interested in film mm -hmm. in, in any way? Yes. So, um, why Los Angeles, uh, beside the fact well, that you... Well, it's funny because I was always, you know, I, I was always drawn to L.A. I remember when I first went to Los Angeles in early 2000 with New York City Ballet, I, would, I stayed afterwards and... There's something about you know all of the cliches that you can hear, but I mean obviously the you know the go gorgeous Swimming landscapes pools. of California and and the interest you know the city being so um, fascinating in terms of all the you know you you drive through LA and you you see the 20s you see in architecture you see the 20s the 30s the 40s the 50s I mean it's all there it's completely it's a truly international city, you know, your, your drive through Koreatown, you know, all of, you know, very, mm -hmm. very much diverse. Um, the light, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it was really, I was always fascinated by it. So I always stayed afterwards and at the point where, um, and also when I actually, when, when, you know, when I joined New York City Ballet, there was this whole group of dancers from SAB and that was sort of traumatic that joined the company that was trying to be made at the time, which was John Clifford's company. Is that the right? Los Angeles yeah. Ballet. And, mm -hmm. and a year later, the, that whole fell, that fell apart, and all my friends were without contracts. So there was, was kept, you know, this history of, of, of complications. And then it was Ethan who started to, you know, uh, was going to take on Ballet Pacifica. And, but I threw, you know, especially Ethan had invited me to work on that first program Ethan with him. Stiefel. Ethan Stiefel. Um, so I, I got to meet people there, and um, the person at the time was Jane Jelanko, who ran Center Dance Arts uh, at the Music Center. And so that project fell apart, and um, I went back, and I remember sitting with her in 2000. Actually, it was interestingly enough, it was um, it was after my f my first commission at Paris Opera. I flew to Los Angeles, so it must have been 2006, um, to do to dance in Nutcracker, which was the first performance of the current Los Angeles Ballet with Paloma Herrera. So I opened their company uh -huh. as the lead in Nutcracker with Paloma, um, and I stayed afterwards for like oh, 10 days. And I met with Jane, and we were brainstorming about maybe starting, you know, what at some point, because I was just, you know, why not dance? And obviously, I like challenges. <laughs> <It seems. laughs> and the fact that, that there was a numerous amount of failures, uh, you know, uh, still, I guess, interested me. So we t spoke and spoke, and then we kept in touch. 
And my wife lived in LA when, you know, uh, we weren't married yet. Natalie uh, lived in LA, so when I quit New York City Ballet, I started to spend more time in LA. Uh -huh. And the last thing that I wanted was to start a dance company in LA at the time. I wanted, like, I wanted to just take the time to make more work and work yeah. on film and, and so forth. And, uh, but Jane Drilenko hadn't forgotten. You know, she, the music center did not forget that I had moved there. So they started to actually make an offer, frankly, that uh, they could start up the company uh, with a small amount of money. And um, then I thought, OK, well, then I need to find someone to to help. <laughs> this is so amazing because I was born and grew up in Los Angeles and dance companies didn't exactly flourish there. The big ballet companies came through. Bella Lewitsky, uh, Horton, Lester Horton had died. Bella Lewitsky taught. There were some wonderful teachers there. Adolf Bohm, people had dropped out of the ballet roofs. There were people studying ballet, um, but they had nowhere to dance except Movies. I mean, that mm -hmm. the that uh, people didn't local dance companies didn't flourish. So it's really wonderful to hear that companies. I mean, John Clifford's problem, notwithstanding, that companies have taken root there. Yeah, I think honestly, the projects prior to ours were um, too ambitious financially. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, the idea that you know you can sort of start up a six million dollar budget, you know, uh, uh, in a place like LA where literally you have to, that was the whole idea was to really build very, very slowly um, and start small. And at the same time, what was, what's interesting is it, it confronted me with this whole um, system, you know, system, American system of private funding. While today, <coughs> you know, I, I, running Paris Opera, it's the complete opposite where, you know, it's all government funding, taxpayers' money. There's more dance companies and choreographer centers in France than probably any country in the world. Um, and how there's there's problem with that system too. And there's you know so it's it, it's been a very um, interesting learning experience. I mean, part of the what was clear at the start is that when we started when we started the company was that we this the this system of just trying to you know raise money for uh, private funding and we we needed to create something else. Mm -hmm. to make it work. Uh, so we've developed a whole, I think, at this point, uh, system that's worked very well for us and that we're still in the process of, you know, moving forward and, you know. But you have forth. an audience. We have an audience. I, that's what excited me the most was the fact that I, I knew that the, 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 there's a young audience interested in culture and art in LA um, that comes by the thousands to see certain things. Mm -hmm. and. I, that's the audience I wanted at the, at the shows, and we have a very much a young, very young, very enthusiastic audience at our performances. It's really, it's, it's incredible, actually. Yeah, I, looking at the, the, the uh, DVDs of the performances, I heard the applause. Right. You know, I could hear the, the excitement of the crowd. Yeah, there's a sense of discovery. They're not judgmental, you know, they, they take everything in. It's, mm -hmm. Um, I often say, like starting a dance company in 2012 in LA was, uh, was like it was to the visual artists in the 60s. You know, when there's no precedent, when you know there's there's no you're supposed to New York, which is, is so saturated with organizations, and <clears throat> even though um, you know people are very much used to writing checks here in a different way <laughs> than LA, um, it was it's it's been exciting. You you also did an interesting thing, which is you you grouped some you got some collaborators together so that you had a kind of consortium of of advisors like Nicolo, Nico Muli and mm -hmm. and others. So you you had a, I don't want to say a support group, but people who fed you. Yeah, but I think I think that's so important. I mean, I think when you run a company, you have to surround yourself with pe with uh, really terrific people who have ideas. Also, you know, I think the you know New York City Ballet wasn't built by Balanchine alone and. And 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 Jagiellos Ballerus, you know, uh, obviously either. Um, so, I think, you know, when you have when you, when when Belshin had someone like Lincoln, who was in, you know, had a, a really was in doing so many interesting th things in the city. I mean, it's remarkable. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, but but that's the kind of you want to have these 
brains will also have time to be in other circles mm -hmm. and, and look at art and, you know, but it, yeah, listen I to music and that you can call and talk to and then, you know, sort of assess and, 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 and that's very, very important. Yeah, and it's a youth, it's sort of a youthful thing to do uh, because Lincoln Kirstein for Balanchine, he did all the, a lot of the bringing in of the artists. Um, whereas you have a couple of people who are interested in production, two composers, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, but because, yes, uh, essentially yes, but you know, I would say that Charles and I really decide the programming. We do call on to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know friends, my friend Mathieu or Nico when we have, you know, mm -hmm. we're looking at music or we're looking at, you know, which, which also I anyway spend, I do spend a lot of time doing. But um, the point is to have, like, a Lincoln Kirstein, is to have, uh, you know, a Jagielef, is to have people who, you know... It's With money yeah, and well, taste. Yeah, I mean... And friends. Absolutely. With taste yeah, and money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, you must have found it very interesting to, be, to begin with because you'd been used to working. I mean, you had made pas de deux and so on. But you had, all, you had done a lot of dancing in ballets that had large casts, and you had created some ballets for large mm -hmm. casts. So here you go to Los Angeles, and you have six, seven, eight mm -hmm. dancers. So how, how does your way of working with them cre creatively differ from... I mean, I feel um, that, you know, uh, my whole path with choreography has been such an experiment uh, for years. Um, the, whole point, the whole point of this company also was not to try and start a ballet company because you don't start a ballet company at the top. You just can't mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, I, I was just in New York City Ballet and, and the only way that I would have wanted to really start a ballet company would have been to dancers on that level. And also, the country has many ballet companies and that dance balancing work and so forth. What the country, to me, really lacks today is some, some great modern dance companies that actually perform the historical repertory that, you know, the Cunningham work and the Graham work and, you know, the Trisha, I mean, all of these are hardly seen on stages. Mm -hmm. So first it was that element um, and I knew I could find those, dan I could still find five dancers that were great. I needed great dancers, uh, which mm -hmm. we took some time to find. And um, so then, I mean, I, I come from a ballet company. I mean, obviously, I'm really a ballet choreographer. You know, I'm, I'm not, um, I'm interested in ballet first and foremost. Um, I've tried a lot of different things because I've been questioning what the direct, you know, really what the direction to take mm -hmm. Personally, as a choreographer, is because I also question what direction is important for ballet today. Because I just, it's you know, that's part of. So I think all of these elements that go through, that have gone through my thinking, are, have, are also shown in how I experiment with choreography. Mm -hmm. So, but it, you know, I, you're right. I, I came and I didn't have ballet dancers yeah, and, 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 and no point shoes and no point shoes. And so. Um, the, you know, and, and it was at a time where I was trying to go from trying to do work that was less composed and crafted to music and maybe just experiment more with ideas of movement mm -hmm. and personalities and, you know, take a piece of music that maybe served more as the atmosphere, which is very much the piece that, that you're seeing this week. It's, it's sort of a series of pieces that... Uh, or not background music because they have a very specific tone, mm -hmm. but the movement is sort of created independently from the music, which is really an experiment. And I cr and the material is created with the dancers for the piece that I that I made this week. But um, are you talking about reflections? Yeah, reflections. Yeah, uh, the which piece that will be see. will be will be seen this week at BAM. Um, in any case, you know, it's it's just it, it was an interesting experiment. Um, but <laughs> I wanted to really work with them in this piece and let them uh, sort of direct them. And some sections are entirely choreographed by me and some of them I, I directed them with very specific movement mm -hmm. ideas that they made, came up with, and then I, you know, sort of shifted and took apart and, you know. 
Well, and you right. had you 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 had some pretty brainy or have some pretty brainy dancers, people who would they weren't people who'd come up through a a ballet academy. They mm. were graduates of Juilliard, they were graduates of Purchase, mm -hmm. SUNY Purchase. So they had studied ballet and modern dance and uh, choreography and, you know, so they were, it, it wasn't your usual very young 16-year-old ballet yeah, dancer. Abso uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and there is also some things to put, you know, back into order because I think um, in terms of the kind of work that they would be dancing, because they're, they're doing a lot of, they're, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. From working, you know, then when Justin came in, he made this work completely composed and crafted to the score, and very elaborate, you know, uh, in its construction, and with no creative freedom for them, except that all of the work is made specifically on these dancers and their quality, so it was a different kind of, kind of approach. Yes, because Justin Peck, who is very hot right now, uh, New York City Ballet commissions, commissions from other ballet companies, and he can compose in an extremely, you know, adventurous classical mode, point shoes, all that. But it's as if in this uh, murder, what's the second part murder of it? Murder ballads. Murder ballads. Uh, seeing it, I'm anxious to see it uh, tomorrow because it's as if he looked at your dancers and said, whoa, those are kind of rambunctious people. It, they don't look like ballet dancers at all. It doesn't look like um, just some of the Justin Peck works we've seen, except that it's very beautifully structured and all that. But it, it's as if he got a boost from the dancers. Yeah, it was, it was very impressive because um, you could sort of walk in there and... Um, I think, you know, I, I, in a way, my, my, my approach, I went more towards them, you know, in, in, the, in the way that I, you know, I led them. We sort of, it was a different, and he walked in and he figured out exactly how to create something that is completely <laughs> him and what he's very, very good at using these, I mean, these dancers, you know, qualities, um, and, and it, it just all works mm -hmm. somehow. So that was that was, you know, very very successful collaboration mm -hmm. with the dancers. And, yeah. Well, so now you're now the artistic director, whatever it's called, regisseur, whatever of the, of the Paris Opera Ballet. And I read somewhere that tonight, October fifteenth, was the day you were going to be officially in charge. There's there's dates. Uh, no, actually, I start November first. So that's on November first. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now you have an enormous ballet company with a long history and a, a formidable establishment of bureaucracy. Um, and so you have this LA dance project and you have this enormous uh, company. Um, I'm thinking, You're going to bring fresh ideas there, and you're also adapting to a, a structure that has existed for mm -hmm. centuries. So, h how are you conceiving this? Uh, I know you've you've told me some amazing plans that you have, um, but I'm curious to know, f for these people well, to know how you how you how you approach this institution with your. Well, yeah. You know. So, I mean, I think this. This is an interesting moment in time for me because um, I think it's the culmination of a lot of that process of thinking uh, as uh, about dance and about ballet, and um, which I did through my work, and I, I've I felt so far mainly, you know, trying different ideas, and some that's why very sometimes it's been confusing to people to see two ballets that are uh, this ballet that we're presenting is very different from others. But um, when, you st when you get to the Paris Opera, I mean, I think the most important for me in my thinking process was to really understand the history of, of the ballet company and really the history of ballet and how 
Paris Opera had such an important place in the history of ballet, uh, really until the you know mid 1800s, and then how the history of ballet really went other places, you know, went to Russia, and then really happened in, in 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 America in the 20th century, with of course some also in England, but it, it, it sort of really m make an assessment of of all of that and. Um, understand or, or think about how to create ballets um, for the company today. First of all, dancing, you know, because I think there's this, there's this whole idea of, you know, French, French technique and so forth, and, you know, it's interesting because it's really, really, really French styles, and, you know, styles were really pushed by choreographers and by new ballets and, and, and change and evolve through, through history. So, like, uh, my place as a choreographer in, in, in the Opera House, um, the ballets from the past that in, in repertory that will be that will be done, and how to create ballets that feel relevant to our time, um, and yeah, and I think essentially, you know, it's it's going to be about who who I bring in and for what purpose, for what projects, <laughs> um, and ballet is really this company has been very open-minded and very you know Bushido Sun has brought some. Wonderful, wonderful contemporary choreographers, mm -hmm. uh, like, unlike any other ballet directors in the world. Um, so all of that still will, there still will be that open mind, but I think uh, ballet is really the big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, that's where I think things have to be really tightened, and and uh, and then, you know interesting ideas need to be. And programming you know. to choosing what will go with yeah. what, but. I mean, your ideas, some of which he can't d can't share with us yet because he's not officially, they're not officially announced. Season's announcement. Season February. announcement. But I was thinking, is it true that you're bound by a rule about, uh, you can't say, take somebody from the corps de ballet and put them in a leading role, you have to use the étoile, the... No, you can, actually, you can. I just... I just I just <laughs> casted two dancers that are Corey Faye, so two principal roles, and apparently that wasn't very, very much done before. No, I no. think not. But it wasn't. There wasn't <laughs> too much barking. There wasn't too much barking. <laughs> because we're very used to this the Pacific well, Northwest Ballet. Well, because I, I think every every all the dancers know how good these two dancers are. So I think that's yeah, <laughs> of course. But we're used to that with ballet theater, the Pacific Northwest Ballet. That some really wonderful core dancer is suddenly dancing a principal role. It doesn't mean they get promoted or get more salary necessarily, mm. but but they get the chance to dance. So that's good to tweak that <coughs> tradition a little and, and push yeah, them. And I, and I think, I mean, music is very, you know, very important, the choice of scores throughout the season. Um, we have the chance to have this phenomenal or orchestra. Um, so I, I'm paying great attention to both the commissions, mm -hmm. uh, but also the repertory and what they're, what they're playing. Um, we have 160 people work on costumes a year round, you know, the best set shop, I think. Um, out there as well, mm -hmm. so all of that uh, is is an environment where very conducive to to taking chances and and bringing interesting collaborators for projects. Do you think you'll get much of a chance to choreograph yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's an important role because I think um, as the director, you sort of you know you have to teach. Uh, they haven't had a director that teaches, I think, for I'm, I don't even think Noriev taught. You know, I think the sort of the vision of dancing was never translated through classes. Uh, you know, Moriev obviously coached rehearsals and was a big influence. But but uh, you know, the sort of more the, the the model of like a choreographer director that um, infuses his idea, th you know, and styles. I mean, that hasn't that hasn't happened in Paris in some time because it's you know there's a kind of a division between. The company and the ERP and the same and, the and so but forth. But this, this is really good for the company and maybe fun for you because we were speaking earlier about musicality and how sometimes dancers just lose that if they're not pushed in the right way or ha taught to well, listen. I, I think I mean there's a big, you know, there's a problem with honestly, you know, music played poorly with ballet orchestras. You or know, bad, in general. bad rehearsal and bad, and bad scores. I mean, if you think of the fact that, you know, 
when Tchaikovsky wrote Sleeping Beauty, uh, it was because the director of the theater knew that Minkus like, wasn't, you know, was enough, it was enough of Minkus, and then Tchaikovsky wrote Sleeping Beauty. I mean, and that we're still, mm -hmm. you know, we still have so many of those, those, those scores that are just, you know, not good enough. <laughs> um, and also just new ideas for, for new ballets. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was always surprising to me that for the 100th anniversary of the Ballet Russe, you know, the way that most companies found to celebrate that event was to recreate works on the same scores, you know, mm -hmm. like another, another yeah. favorite, another this, another that, and um, for a company that was all about the new. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, so, but essentially, I mean, I, I think, you know, really the, the approach to ballet and, and, and ballet today is really the, the big, the mm -hmm. big challenge and um, in, in terms of how to make Paris Opera really relevant today. Well, and also you being so musical yourself, if you're teaching classes in the school or a company class, you have, you're in a position well, to emphasize right, music. Well, yeah, ballet is all in relation to music. So I, I think, um, you know, classes, one of the things that I've noticed is how, first of all, the pian pianists play the same, even audio level throughout. There's no like piano or forte or, you know. There's, so first of all, you have to get pianists to really pay very, you know, a lot of attention to the quality of the music and the fact that they need to play sometimes very soft or depending because it's all about even at bar. I mean, bar isn't just gym gymnastics. It's or you know, essentially, you're doing combinations. You're training your body to memorize positions and so forth. But it's you're all already responding to the music. You're dancing. Um, so that's a very very important element. Um, and to, rhythms can be more complex or less complex, and you have to challenge your dancers to respond to rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that it just becomes inherent when by the time they, they go to, you know, but the repertory has to do that. If you have to dance the ballets that have uh, interesting musicalities, if you don't, um, you know, in, in, in little by little, like, the, you know, the, the, this musical, musicality is lost. But it's not just also being on the rhythm or not, it's also, um, you know, re responding to um, the tone of the music. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to smile if the music isn't, if it's, you know, super melancholic Russian music. <laughs> <laughs> or this, you know, this, again, like this idea of, of letting the audience know I'm having fun, you know, is something you see all, all over the place. Um, instead of really, the audience comes to you instead of trying to go to them so much. Um, being yourself mm -hmm. and, and responding to the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember here years ago classes at the Joffrey Ballet and they had uh, one teacher, Bill Griffith, who was very musical. And it made an enormous impression, I think, that's not like the Paris Opera Ballet, of course, just a ballet class, that he would bring music in and put it in front of the pianist and say, let's try this for the plies. And she would respond very excitedly. And the dancers would have to listen. Because what made him choose that? Why is it working so well? Mm -hmm. So uh, that idea of getting dancers to be more musical from the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think that's um, <coughs> it's very, very important. Yeah. It's a you know, certain appreciation. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, that's, that's the beauty of it is how we have this great orchestra. I mean, when... My ballet, Daphne St. Chloe, was performed there last spring. It was just, you know, the orchestra alone with the 80 chorus, because we also have our own chorus. Wonderful. It was just unbelievable. Yes. It really was. Um, but, but yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, ballet is so much a response to music, and, and, and that it's a very, very important um, aspect of that. You know what I hope to bring. Well, you made an you made at least one very very adventurous choice for LA Dance Project in having a revival of Merce Cunningham's Winter Branch, which, when performed here uh, for the first time in the '60s at Lincoln Center as part of a, a repertory thing, the audience was affronted uh, at in a way that New York audience, they didn't boo or hiss, but they were, because it sounded as if, it sounded a little bit, John Cage's uh, score sounded a little bit as if you had a dentist drill 
in one you know, ear and uh, a, um, what do you call it, breaking, breaking up the street, jackhammer. jackhammer, and you had a jackhammer in the other, and you know, you just were sort of immobilized in this beautiful work. Uh, how did the audience, I mean, how did you choose that, and then how did the audience respond? Well, um, you know, first of all, I saw the work in, in studio at the Merskine, and I found it riveting. You know, I thought it was Beautiful. very, very interesting, very different than his other works as well. There was sort mm -hmm. of a, a violence in it that, not something that I was used to. And it was a little crazy to put it on an opening night after all these people <laughs> gave all that money <laughs> in L.A. <laughs> but, but that was the point. I mean, the point was also in a time where I think a lot of directors are concerned with you know bringing the audience into the theater and making more sort of commercial choices um, you know uh, what matters is what goes on the stage and the quality of the art and it's not about you know bringing someone in just because they're a name or they're going to bring in an audience or it's you know sort of uh, the idea here is that 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 piece is First of all, it's also dance. Dance doesn't have to be joyful. Dance doesn't have to be, you know, you, you could really compare that work to a uh, contemporary installation piece. I mean, mm -hmm. if it was seen today in a museum, it's as new as it was when he, when mm -hmm. he made it. Mm -hmm. um, it also happens to have some, one of the most interesting lighting. By you know, Robert Rauschenberg. By Robert Rauschenberg. Um, it conceptually, it's really, really incredible, and it's a very dark, mm -hmm. very dark work, and that's art too. You know, you don't, what you goes on the stage doesn't just, you know, it's so much of the attempts that I've seen lately are about, you know, pleasing the audience to the extent that, you know, you're, you're making a, a choice that's too commercial to put it next to a ballet of great integrity, uh, then it doesn't work, because people who come to see this sort of superficial work of art aren't going to like Agon or, you know, mm -hmm. something that... So it was a point to say, like, I'm not going to do that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, and, to, and to say that that's also dance to me. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and audiences who w tend to reject it also tend to think, I mean, we're, we all like to think we're smarter than we are, <laughs> at least I do, <laughs> you know, and we see it, and well, this, this is really hard to take, but you know what? I, I, it's something I need to get used to. You know, you, there's that feeling in, in audiences that they, if they don't just walk out or reject it, that they think, I'm growing up. I'm understanding things I didn't understand before. Yep. No, I mean, uh, I think you you have many images come to mind when you when you see when you see that work, mm -hmm. um, and it it is very uncomfortable in a very interesting way, and there's many movies that make you feel that way, you yeah. know, and there is there is sure. visual art that makes you feel that way, and there is and well, scores, you know, that that are incredibly interesting that aren't easy to listen aren't to. Aren't easy to listen to, and and actually the quintet of of. William Forsythe that's being presented on this program here is not an easy work, I would say. It was a work created in great pain and distress after the death of his wife, and it's, it's, a, it's a violent piece in a way. It's, it's beautiful in a, in, a, in a disturbing way, so that's not a popular choice, even though William Forsythe is that's, very... That's interesting because I... You know, I don't see the piece as violent yeah. at all. Don't. I mean, I I saw it here um, in '98, maybe mm -hmm. it was, and I remember I came and then I I came back to see it again immediately, yes. like the next it's, night. It's very powerful. And I was actually talking to Justin about it, and he said, "I love that work. When it ends, I want to see it all over again," which is how I remember feeling exactly when I saw it. Um, Again, you know, you have this Gavin Breyer's completely, you know, the music, yes. beautiful, beautiful score, which is so evocative and um, of a time and place somewhere. You know, yes. it's sort of really, really beautiful. And it's very much about these relationships between the dancers, mm -hmm. again, uh, and the, the playfulness of the partnering, mm -hmm. and which is 
very Balanchinian to me in the way that the partnering exists in that, specifically in that mm -hmm. ballet. Um, having danced a lot of patterns and how one thing go to the next and how certain things repeat and how certain, you know, with, um, so I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a work that I think even though, yes, was sort of a mourning kind of piece is very much a celebration of life. Um, and I think so. Oh. And a, a love for dance that, you know, obviously. And memories, and memories of tender yeah. moments and, and in that too. Yeah. It, um, yeah, it's a it's a very it's a very beautiful work, and but you know not happy or not. I That's mean, true. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it, it has it 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 has its. Uh, it's not Bella that Regina. That's it's, that. <laughs> it yeah. has its dark sides. Yeah. Um, and so maybe we should open this to questions now because some of you may have questions. If you do, wait a second and somebody will bring you a mic. So. Two in the front row here. So this lady, and then she can hand it off. Yeah. As a dancer and choreographer, how do you view your relationship to the audience? I'm sorry? As a dancer and choreographer, how do you view the relationship that you have um, to the audience when you're how does how does he um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot easier being a dancer, actually. <laughs> Yeah, there's something really, um, if that's what you're asking, um, always difficult about putting a, a new piece in front of an audience because it, it's something so personal. Do you think that that it's like opening night? That you're always sort of you s it's amazing how much fun and enjoyable and, and you know you can be in the process of of making everything and just ah, and then opening night arrives and it's you're sort of like why am I doing this to myself? Yes. <laughs> Are they going it to? Really it really is. It's <laughs> always a shock, like the day of a the, the day of uh, of a show. Uh, yeah, and dancing in front of an audience. I mean, especially the luck of doing it at New York City Ballet, where it was just it's sort of like putting on a you know you're just in the theater all day, you're rehearsing, and then you just get you for the show and you're on stage. And there's a you know by the time you're 25, you have no nerves anymore, and it's just totally you know a glorious experience. Yes. Could you compare the contracts of the dancers at City Ballet with those in Paris? For example, are they unionized in Paris? How do the compensation? Oh yes, they're does unionized. The compensation, <laughs> how does the compensation compare? Other benefits? How many uh, well, weeks of work are they guaranteed? There, no, no. It's very. It's trust me. It's a major topic and a very interesting one. So they're paid throughout the year. They're actually, yeah, they're paid all year. Uh, they get, they, the, the men, I mean, no, no, make sure I'm right here, the, no, the women, I think the retirement age just changed, but I think it's about 42. They stay in the company until they're 42 years old, and when they retire, they get a pension. It's mandatory retirement? Well, you, you know, you have a cotization, so, you know, you get your full, full pension, you know, by the time, if you, if you leave sooner, then you get less, and so forth. Um, so that's very... It's great. Mm -hmm. um, what also happens is that you have uh, you can't be fired overnight. You know, people don't get fired. So you know, there's the, the, you don't have the kind of you know. Here, I sign a year a yearly contract every year. And when I was in New York City Ballet, that's what you get, and you get 38 weeks, something like that, I think, contract. Um, so you're always on the edge of your seat. I mean, you could be fired every year. You could, you know, so people are on point. <laughs> uh, so what, what's also interesting is the fact that there is no pension. You know, you have dancers now, and much more so these today than, the, than, than when I first started, uh, who keep going to school uh, while they're dancing here in New York. And what I find in Paris is that the dancers have no, there, there, there's no ambition in terms of what they could do after their dancing career. They don't think about what they're going to do. They have this little pension. Um, and what usually happens is that two or three years before they retire, they start to, you know, in France, everything's free. So they could get a little, for, you know, they could study a little something here just to become a masseuse or, or something else, so they, it's, it's paid for, and they, so they figure something out right before. But they're not ambitious. Um, and so that's something that I've talked to them about 
already about the, to the whole company because it's it's sad in a way. You know, dance is a very uh, you need so much discipline. You need you need you know intelligence and discipline and and and, and you could actually dan these dancers would be able to do actually wonderful things, uh, but they're not. They don't think about it. They're not. You know, so it's a whole new kind of system and opportunities to uh, give them so that they are thinking about what they're gonna do after. And also, you don't want someone, you know, I was done at 32, imagine if at, you know, I, w I, I was not interested anymore in going on the stage and I was gonna wait around 10 years uh, and just kind of dance until I get this pension. Um, so a dancer, if he doesn't want to dance at 35, he should go, because I can hire someone else <laughs> who also wants to dance, but not, not only for that reason, but I think ultimately, uh, you know, to have a good life and to have an interesting life. Uh, so that's something that, I, that, I, that I'm, you know, already talking to them about and, and figuring out how to sort of, you know, make them think about what happens after they dance. And also, I mean, part of, I think the, 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 the repertory and, uh, you know, that will be performed and, you know, we're creating a, a choreography academy as well, which will be part of the, part of the company which really will be a year program for dancers who are interested in choreography to really learn about the craft of choreography. Um, to really make them very, you know, provided with all as much information, cultural information about dance and music and so forth, to be also good teachers when they retire and, you know, do good things for the world of ballet. How, how uh, oh, wait, 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 please, please, let's, let's see if we have another question. Um. Hi, Ben. How are you? Um, yes. Um. Uh, how, um, how you direct both the LA Dance Project and the Paris Opera, like how you divide your time between the both? So, you know, essentially, um, my focus will be, you know, primarily Paris Opera. You know, I have, I have uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, it's a full-time job, and, um, you know, it, it, it takes, especially in this first year, uh, there's a lot of uh, logistical organization administration mm -hmm. um, to organize in a way that I feel is efficient. Uh, and you know, I've, I've, I mean, I change all the dance floors in the theater already. There's, we're changing the schedule. Uh, I mean, their daily work, their daily activities. I mean, there's a whole sort of structural thing that will happen in this, in, especially in this next year. I think what what um, you know, what's very exciting about my life today is the fact that I <clears throat> get to think about creative projects with uh, Imagine New Ballets, uh, look at a lot of dance, look at, um, you know, I mean, we're, we're com combining, I wish I could tell you more about the season uh, in 2016. But in but the meantime, you, you have people who are in charge of the well, company in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. So but I think in terms of programming, there's no question that, you know, uh, there, were, there will be ways to, you know, program LA Dance Project, even though I'll be running, you know, uh, Paris Opera and, and, and help support something that I, that I started in a, you know, in a meaningful way because uh, it's really important. I mean, I think in this country, it's, it's crazy when you think you, we're trying to raise money for LA Dance Project and there's no kind of, it's the, it's the company that has the best shot at you know, making it in LA and there's no, there's no like, funds for culture, for government support whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the totally opposite of the spectrum in Paris. Um, to think that there isn't some kind of logical person who would say, you know, hey, let's help make this big, and you know, they could do education program and go to the schools, and, but we're building that. You know, I brought James and Jenny to the Colburn School, and you know, there's this whole other wonderful education, dance education project called the Gabriella Foundation, and you know, what we're doing is sort of linking partners and so forth, and you know, well surround, you know, being well surrounded in LA will, will, will allow the dance project to um, well run, to you know, well to, to, run. Yes. to continue to grow, yeah. Somebody over here, yes, who has the mic there? Yeah, can you please talk a little more about some of the modern dance choreographers that were, whose works you're sort of reviving and working well, with? Well, I've been really you know, interested to revive some Graham works, uh, Martha Graham, because I recently came up, came, you know, um, came across this 
amazing we were talking before uh, from Diversion, Diversion, Diversion of, of Angels, of Angels and, and, and the, that whole film in the studio which actually is without costumes it's just practice clothes and these duets are their narrative uh, in the most subtle way and they're incredibly well structured and interesting and totally modern so when you see work like that you think well you know let's let's put it on the stage and let's produce it really well. Let's make sure it's well lit. Let's make sure it's well, you know. So that's really exciting because you bring back something that people are going to see in a, in a, in a light that is going to be completely modern and be relevant to new works today. So that's, that's definitely uh, something that we're going to be doing more and more uh, at LA Dance Project, yes. L the yes. Graham lied. Uh, well, that, that's, yes, there was another question here. Um, you've touched upon this a little bit already, but I was curious if you could um, talk a little bit more about uh, how the audiences in LA, New York, and Paris, um, how you find them to be different, um, and how that might affect decisions about programming, not from a commercial perspective, but more in ways you might like to push them or expose them to different things. Right. So let's talk about Paris. Well, Paris, you know, because it's subsidized, tickets are cheap, and much cheaper than New York um, to go to the ballet. So last year, with 170 shows, two houses, it was 98% full, 98.5% full, which is incredible. Um, and that audience has seen, it's Paris. Paris, more than any other city in the world, sees everything first. They will come, you know, there's on uh, many given nights you have dance in like five theaters and it's full. So the audience is very much um, ready for anything, you know. It's probably like, oh, you're going to, it's going to be removing the dust. There's not, there's not like, you know, there's like, you know, it's not, I don't need to present, it's not about presenting works that are provocative and shake things up or, you know, it's about doing, smart things and good things and so forth, but the, so the audience is young. It's still quite elitist, you know, in terms of not very diver diverse uh, in the theater, uh, even though Paris is a very, very diverse city. So that's something that, that's, in, that's an, an interesting problem to fix, which, which first, you know, I think has to do also with what, you know, is on the stage. Um, because, you know, if you don't have people you can relate to on the stage, also, I think it's, a, it's an issue. So that's something that I've started to work on also. Um, but there's, you know, the, the Paris Opera is also uh, this, the luck that we have is we have this, we have the two theaters, Bastien and Garnier. But Garnier is this monumental, stunning opera house that um, we make six million euros just on visits alone every year. So people just come to see that theater, you know, alone, you know, even if we put on the silliest ballets in there, <laughs> to some extent. But there's no reason that we, I think one of the things you have to do, which we've done in LA, is you have to leave the theater. You have to go and perform in other places where, uh, for example, you know, uh, we're going to be working potentially with Palais de Tokyo in the museum, but there's also, you know, outdoor performances at the Louvre, like free performances. Uh, there's, there's... With that big of an institution and with 154 dancers, there's no reason that you can't take a few dancers and with a really interesting project and take it somewhere else uh, where you are going to come across an audience that doesn't, uh, that hasn't seen the Paris Opera. I mean, one, you know, frankly, the most exciting way to reach a diverse audience is really this project that, that this Gabriella Foundation that exists in, in LA, which teaches dance classes to all these underprivileged neighborhoods for a few dollars a month, uh, and great, great dance classes. And eventually these kids who, you know, have, uh, you know, f these classes are, are refuge for them. They're, you know, they're, uh, uh, eventually they do a show together, and then the idea of creating something like that and then bringing that to Paris Opera would be amazing. That probably won't happen right away. You, you, also, do, you, but you, you also uh, broadened the Los Angeles. I, I don't know a lot about the audience in Los Angeles, but you did, uh, you did a duet in the Museum of Contemporary Art, and yep. you, you, did, uh, you did something in the Union Station. Did well, you? that was the beauty of, of that's you know that's the beauty of LA Dance Project that it's a small you know company we can do things move quickly and yeah. so like, try things out. I mean, when I arrived, I created a piece with a uh, with Mark Bradford, who's a painter, uh, which took place in the museum, um, and I danced with uh, this you know Amanda Wells throughout uh, Mocha. Um, 
and it was it was an interesting piece, and you know there were people lined up around the block to see it. Um, it. We couldn't actually get everybody to see it. It was so popular. And then the other very I think interesting project that we did was the train station, which is this um, this opera um, that the audience came and put headphones on. The 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 um, orchestra was in one room, and the train train station, which is one of the most beautiful architecturally so um, stations in in L.A. Or the most beautiful station in L.A. Um, you could you'd basically navigate it through the station as if it was Grand Central, full of people, and follow this opera and singers and dancers in different places. And so it was a really, I mean, we think we extended a, a month. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it was so popular. So in in a sense, it's a very good way to grow the yes. audience for Absolutely. dance in Los Angeles. So I mean, LA is a very young, really wonderful audience that's also ready for anything. I mean, there. Are so far, we haven't, you know, their response to works that we've presented has been terrific. Uh, and New York. <laughs> so, um, and New York, you know, I think to some extent you have the problem in ticket pricing. You have the problem, I mean, I, you know, uh, I always felt that, you know, here was the youngest audience um, for dance. Um, you know, at BAM, uh, and, and, and Lincoln Center is tricky for, you know, for the, 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 you know, that issue, the, the ticket, ticket price mainly, and the fact that it, 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 it doesn't necessarily feel accessible to people. And are there any more questions? Yes. Wait, 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 wait. Hi. Don't you have, have to have a lot of confidence in your dancers? to um, have them do Graham Technique and Justin Peck and Bill Forsyth. It's a lot to expect of your dancers, isn't it? Yep. yep. <laughs> it is. <laughs> I have high expectations from yes. my dancers. <laughs> um, yeah, but I have to say, I mean, they're a really, really fine group. I mean, they're there an extraordinary group of dancers. Uh, they've, they've grown so fast. Um, and you know we were talking about that earlier too. I think um, I didn't want them to feel dependent. You know, when you when you're young dancers in a company, there's always this thing with the director, and you're sort of like, you know, what do you, what do you what do you think? How, how, how am I dancing? You know, what should I do better? You know, what could I? And um, I really didn't want to be that person. And you you know, with obviously we have 154 dancers. Um, it can't be as I, I won't be able to do quite what, I'm, what, I've, what I've done here. But still, you know, I, don't, I, want, smart, I want smart people in front of me. I want people who have, have a mind of their own. I mean, I think being an artist and on stage is, is making personal choices. And so you have to give the dancers the freedom to believe in themselves and their choices in order to uh, have something to express. Exactly. Um, and, and Paris Empire very much needs that, you know, because they have this exam every year. They're constantly told, you know, you should do this, you should do that, and completely dependent on this, you know, on the feedback uh, of the mirror or the coach or the teacher. And um, giving them a lot of that independence early on uh, gave them, made them confident. And also they, they, they had so many interesting approaches to dance with the diversity of choreographers they've had in two years, that uh, they have, they've had to be creative, you know, very creative. They also uh, had to teach their parts to new dancers who come in all the time, for the, even in the mm -hmm. last year. Uh, and that's really beneficial as well. So there's something about how creative they've become, and I think the next step is for the company to create a piece as a group, you know, which would be really interesting. <laughs> An exciting okay, time so. for dance, she <laughs> says. Yes. All right. Well, I think we will bring this to an end then. Thank you all very much. Sorry. Thank you very much.